Ed, welcome to our DIA one-on-one -on -one video program. It's so good to see you again. You too, Taryn. Thanks for having me. Ed, let's dig in. When thinking about the industry and where it needs to go in terms of moving forward to this next frontier, what do you think the best approach is in thinking about patients and sites in totality? Well, I think it's it's always important to think what is the primary motivator for each of them. And I think that those motivating factors are the same, actually. First and foremost, there's safety. Uh, obviously, patients are worried about their own safety, but the sites are also worried about the safety for their, their patients. They know them personally in, in most cases. Secondly, and I think one of the critical drivers is the convenience factor. And I think sites and patients may think about convenience a little bit differently, but that's that's ultimately um, uh, one of the critical factors. Sites may consider the effect of the protocol design on their office workflow, uh, the movement of patients throughout the, the site. Um, patients are gonna be thinking about things that are much more practical to them. Like, do they have to drive all the way into a major urban area? It might take them three hours to get in and out. What's that gonna to do to piano practice or uh, softball practice or things like that that are truly part of what they really care about their daily life. So that convenience factor um, in participation is critical. And then third, I think there becomes um, more of an altruistic element. Like, is this is my participation going to benefit uh, the research that's being done. A patient can see a benefit for themselves, but I think we also have uh, a pool of highly motivated patients that are doing this on behalf of others who may have those same symptoms. And certainly the researchers are, are thinking the same thing as they evaluate the protocols. Is this likely to have a benefit? And so those three things, patient safety, convenience, and the benefits are what motivates both sites and patients. Excellent encapsulation, thank you. Um, let's talk about protocols, and there is a growing trend in protocol complexity. How can technology help address this current state of where we are? Yeah, complexity in protocol design has been uh, an area that I've had a particular interest. Um, some of the very earliest research that I uh, participated in my career uh, about 15 years ago with Ken Getz on t in, in the Tufts Institute was in fact on protocol complexity and trying to calculate it, which has continued on. Ken's done a, a really good job there. And I think what that, um, the conclusions that I drew from that is that there are some inherently complex therapeutic areas that we can't control that aspect of complexity when we don't fully understand the biology, we don't really understand the interplay of really complex symptoms, uh, whether that's Alzheimer's or lupus, other CNS conditions, complex immunology, we cannot control for that type of complexity. And so what we need to do is take that as a given and then try to focus on the operational complexities that we can control. And operational complexities can be either increased or decreased by our choices of technology. Uh, Clinical Link as the I like to call us the pioneer of eSource. That was really the genesis of what we were attempting to do is control for operational complexity so that the, the data could really address the underlying clinical complexities. And as we embarked on that, um, probably 10 years, 10 plus years ago, we had a, a, a phrase that we would talk about as the moment that matters, like what happens during that patient visit? that's a moment when you can ostensibly you know the data is being gathered right then collect the data at that moment if you're able to collect it at that moment you can have an impact on protocol compliance unlike any other uh at, at any other point in time collecting it on paper and entering it in, into an edc system later doesn't give you the ability to impact that protocol, which ultimately allows you to have a greater certainty that the data you are collecting is gonna allow you to draw conclusions on the clinical outcomes. That same kind of phrase, the moment that matters, applies in a patient's life too. The idea that's taken so long of um, allowing patients to use their own phones in a study you know, we're one of the few industries that talks about bring your own device. And that's really uh, a function of allowing them to have that device in the moment that they need it, not randomly carrying another device around in the event that they might need to participate. And so technology is ideally 
um, design, it should be intended to simplify pe the patient insights participation in the clinical trial. And that's where we've tried to put our emphasis and is where, um, you know, I think some of the euphoria and excitement about sensors comes in because that's a way of simplifying some of the data collection, making it easier. Um, but, you know, I think putting in more technology just to potentially have more data, I think we're well beyond that. I don't think people do that. Um, but it has to be a very purposeful use um, of the technology in order to simplify it. Excellent. When you were talking, I was remembering back to DIA all those years ago when we first met and you started talking about e-consent. I just had a big flashback back to back in the day. Um, yes, it's, it's taken some come. time to evolve. Right. Look how far we've come and yet not so far as we should have come, right? So, right, right. Going. Um, I, you know, a conversation at this year's DIA wouldn't be complete without having touching on decentralized clinical trials. It's all the rage. What are some of the benefits of DCTs and what are some of the ways to ensure this approach is sustainable for the future since we are moving into the next frontier post COVID? Right. I think um, in my 20 years in this space, I have not seen a technology with such euphoria in such a short period of time. Um, certainly the demands of the moment uh, required that there needed to be a definitive reset and uh, change simply to at the very least salvage the investment that was in studies that were ongoing at the moment and the idea of a decentralized trial is not necessarily a new technology it's a combination of existing technologies that have been there that make remote participation possible and during the era of the pandemic, there was kind of an anything goes approach, let's make sure we can solve it. But what, I, what we have seen is that, and we had you know, financially and commercially our best year ever, simply because we've had a lot of experience with a decentralized approach. Um, because in essence, bring your own device types of EPRO studies are a version of decentralized trial. It makes it easier for patients to participate. That was in fact one of the biggest issues that we saw. You could not get devices shipped internationally when air, air traffic fell. And so the ability to do you know, remote studies on patients' own platforms was critical. But what we've seen outside of the urgency of having to salvage the existing studies is now a resurgence of high complexity therapeutic areas like Alzheimer's and lupus, uh, other CNS studies that are attempting to incorporate elements of decentralized trials. We are um, will be participating in what I would argue would be one of the largest decentralized uh, studies in Alzheimer's. Um, and if you think about that, opening up the door to patients to participate with their caregivers in their home in a way that uh, is a comfortable setting, but um, doesn't suffer from some of the shortcomings of kind of the confusing nature of getting devices to people and in their own homes. I think there's a lot of promise, but it has to be a purposeful part of the study design up front. And I think that's one of the things that's going to be emerging for DCTs is that the regulators are going to have to be involved in the initial study designs. I think that's one of the things that's come is that during COVID there was like a, anything goes and we'll figure it out afterwards. Now it needs to be a much more intense, uh, intentional, purposeful effort to incorporate that for a purposeful clinical outcome, not just for some other, you know, purpose that we want to do a different way of experimenting or build our brand for in another way. We're excited about the possibilities of decentralized trials, but uh, I, again, I kind of chuckle at the the massive euphoria that kind of a, uh, has engulfed it because it's pretty, pretty, I, from a technology standpoint, it's relatively straightforward, I believe. But as you're right, it's the convergence of all these different pieces into one kind of movement that has got everybody so excited. So, mm -hmm. and I think you're right, we are at the figuring out time. So it'll be exciting to see where we go and having the same conversation again next year to see what- Absolutely, happen. look right. forward to it. Hopefully we're making substantial and noticeable progress. Agreed. And thank you so much for spending some time with us. Appreciate it. Thank you, Sharon. appreciate it.